good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are. The International Court of Self-Determination meets today to hear the oral argument in the case concerning the maintenance of Spanish sovereignty of Asoita and Maria in 1956, Morocco versus Spain, and the case concerning Catalonia secession, Catalonia versus Spain. The two cases were joined pursuant to Article 47 of the court's rules of procedure. Given the fictionalized nature of the court, I shall skip the parties noting their representation, the reading out of the submissions and other procedures. The following procedure will be followed. Counsel for the parties will make brief opening statements, starting with Mama Duebie for Morocco, followed by Mr. Mark Weller for Spain. They will be followed by Ms. Milena Stereo for Catalonia and Mr. Nawi Ukabiala for Spain. After this round, the bench will pose questions which will be considered by the parties as part of their argument. Thereafter, I shall make some reflections on the case. This will be followed by a question and answer session from the audience. I now give the floor to Mr. Ebie to make his opening statement for Morocco. Mr. President, it is a great honor for me to appear before the International Court of Self-Determination on behalf of the Kingdom of Morocco. Mr. President, the Kingdom of Morocco is, together with Ethiopia, Iran, and the Kingdom of Johor, one of the oldest members of the international community. In fact, from the 18th century until the 15th century, Morocco was the only sovereign entity existing in Northwest Africa. It enjoyed sovereignty over the entire region, including Ceuta, Septa, and Melilla. The International Court of Justice acknowledged this fact in the Western Sahara Advisor Opinion when it characterized Morocco as a state of a special character. Mr. President, Septa and Melilla were not terra nullius. They were captured by Spain and Portugal through unlawful wars in 1415 and 1497. Morocco has never ceased to claim their return. Your, the decision of the, court of, of the International Court of Self-Determination upholding its jurisdiction to hear this case is already a victory for the rule of law. After six centuries, time has finally come. Law will be upheld, justice will be delivered. The last remnant of colonialism will be dismantled and Morocco territorial integrity restored. Mr. President, SEPTA and Melilla are non-self-governing territories that should be decolonized by virtue of the right of self-determination. Resolution 1541 on non-self-governing territories defined uh, non-self-governing territories as a territory which is geographically separate and ethnically and culturally distinct from the territory of the power administering it and which is placed in a situation of subordination. This is exactly the situation of SEPTA and Melilla. Spain practice with respect to these two territories are quite clear. They have been used as military fortresses. Their population is composed mainly of soldiers. They have been proposed, the two island, the two, Semsta and Melilla have been offered to Great Britain in exchange of uh, Gibraltar. And recently Spain has tried to relocate its population in Septa and Melilla at the expense of the local Moroccan population. Such an exported population cannot enjoy any right to self-determination. 
This brings me to my conclusion, Mr. President. Septa and Melilla are the archetype of territories subject to the obligation to decolonize under international law, and they should be reintegrated to the Kingdom of Morocco to which they have belonged since time immemorial. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Habib. I now give the floor to Mr. Vela, Council for Spain. Thank you, President. President, we live in difficult times, and in difficult times, we tend to reflect and focus on what is essential for us. And for us as international lawyers, there are essential principles of the international system that preserve and protect us, our lives in peace and dignity. And the most essential international rule seeking to achieve that aim is the rule of territorial integrity and the prohibition of the use of force. Morocco is challenging this elementary sense of peace and security that has required many centuries to be built up and validated. For it demands territory from Spain simply because it is there and because Morocco wants it. There is no claim to this territory of any kind, or rather, no legal claim. This goes directly against the well-established doctrine of the stability and finality of boundaries, which guarantees peace and security for us all. Morocco used force in 1957, Mr. President, when it invaded Ifni and occupied it. Morocco used force in 1975, when it marched into the Western Sahara, subjugating the very population that was just emerging from a consensus-based process of decolonization arranged by Spain. And this occupation happened against the express ruling of the very sister court of this august body in front of which we are now finding ourselves. In 2002, Morocco occupied the Spanish Parsley Islands through military force. And now it is demanding the surrender of further Spanish territory without any legal justification, whatever. We've heard reference already to a number of legal principles, but none of these really apply to this case. And I shall expand on this in the actual presentation of the law that I think is to follow in the next segment. But for now, what possible basis can there be for a claim on a territory that A, was never part of the Uti Positatis boundaries of the territories that became Morocco? There was no Morocco in, 15, in 1415. Uh, there are no links between the territory and its population to what later became the Sultanate, Sultanate of Morocco. And this is the big distinction to Western Sahara. Even there, where there were such links, Morocco's claim was denied, and there are no such links here. Indeed, the Sultanate, as you say, a sovereign entity, concluded numerous treaties confirming that Ceuta and Melilla are Spanish and will be so in perpetuity. And see, the territory has its own population that has over 600 years developed its distinct identity and strong attachment to Spain and that, that has been treated by Madrid as a fully constitutional sanctified part of Spain and is fully represented in that territory. These are not just soldiers and occupants, I have to say. These are traders, citizens, individuals, Spanish, who peacefully want to pursue their life. And we will urge this High Court, therefore, to disown this attempt to bully a sovereign state into surrendering its territory and an unwilling population. An attempt by another state merely because that territory lies geographically close to the bully and merely because that state demands the territory without any legal justification. Thank you, President. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vela. I now give the floor to Ms. Stereo, Counsel for Catalonia. Thank you, Mr. President. In my opening argument, I will advance two points. First, that the people of Catalonia possess the right to self-determination. And second, because their right to self-determination has not been respected by Spain, the appropriate remedy in this case is the exercise of self-determination through remedial secession by the people of Catalonia. First, the people of Catalonia clearly possess the right to self-determination. 
It is undisputable that the Catalan constitute a people. They speak a different language, have a distinct ethnicity from the Spaniards, possess a common sense of identity, and have for years laid a well-defined territorial claim to Catalonia. All peoples possess the right to self-determination under international law. International law sources which confirm the existence of the right to self-determination include the United Nations Charter itself, the International Covenant for Civil and Political Rights, the International Covenant for Social, Cultural and Economic Rights, the Friendly Relations Declaration, um, as well as other numerous international law sources. The right has also been confirmed in several rulings by the International Court of Justice, including the Wall case, the Kosovo case, and most recently, the Chagos Archipelago case. Second, the appropriate remedy for the people of Catalonia is the exercise of self-determination through remedial secession. The right to self-determination exists in two forms, internal and external. It is well established in international law that all peoples have the right to internal self-determination, which is normally exercised through autonomy within a larger mother state. If the mother state violates the people's right to ex internal self-determination, then in extreme circumstances, the people may invoke its right to external self-determination. In this instance, Spain has revoked Catalonia's autonomy, has arrested Catalan leaders, and has thereby denied the people of Catalonia with the ability to exercise internal self-determination. The people of Catalonia may, under such, internal, under such extreme circumstances, exercise their right to external self-determination through remedial secession. Precedent for this type of exercise of self-determination exists. The Canadian Supreme Court confirmed that oppressed peoples may be entitled to exercise external self-determination, and the International Court of Justice in the Kosovo Advisory Opinion did not hold that this type of exercise of external self-determination is illegal under international law. Thus, under the famous Lotus Proposition, the exercise of external self-determination is allowed and legal under international law in extreme circumstances of oppression. The people of Catalonia, because they have been oppressed by Spain, are entitled to exercise external self-determination through remedial secession. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Stereo. I now give the floor to Mr. Cabiala, Council for Spain. Thank you, Your Honor. I will argue against Catalonian secession on behalf of the Kingdom of Spain. It's an honor to appear here before this pretend court, the esteem of which cannot be diminished by its fictional character. I convey my most genuine courtesies to opposing counsel, and on behalf of the kingdom, the warmest affection to all Catalonians. The kingdom regrets deeply that the Catalonians have pursued this course that threatens its bond of fraternity with the Spanish people and the political and territorial unity of the kingdom. The history and destiny of the kingdom is bound up inextricably with Catalonia. Going back for centuries, all Spanish people, including Catalonians, have been united in solidarity through war and peace, adversity and prosperity, rallying together under a common flag. And the kingdom is proud of its history of addressing all grievances of the Catalonian people through good faith consultation. The kingdom remains always prepared to resolve any grievances held by Catalonians by these means. But today, Catalonia makes submissions that cannot be pleaded justly. This purported entitlement to a unilateral declaration of independence is based on populist impulses and imagined slights. But more pertinently, and as I will show, its claims before this court are not based on any rules of international law. In my main argument, I will proceed by showing first, outside the context of decolonization, the right to self-determination does not entail a right to secession. And second, and in the alternative, I will show that even if international law recognizes the doctrine of so-called remedial secession, it only applies in extreme cases of oppression or persecution and, and where no alternative remedies are available. Neither of those conditions are met here. The kingdom submits that the court should dismiss the Catalonian claim. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ucabiala. I shall now put some questions from the bench that will be considered by the counsel of each party in their oral arguments. The first question 
is having regard to international law was the decolonization process of Morocco lawfully completed when it gained its independence from Spain in 1956. Question number two, does international law give the legitimate representatives of Catalonia the right to effect cessation of Catalonia from Spain unilaterally as they did through the Declaration of Independence of 10th October 2017. This is a specific question. Then a third general question, which is related to the second one. It has been contended that international law does not prohibit cessation of a territory from a sovereign state. Could the parties in the present proceedings address the court on the rules of international law, if any, which outside the colonial context permit the cessation of a territory from a sovereign state without the latter's consent? Question number four, has the right of self-determination acquired the status of a preemptory norm of general international law, Euskogens. I now give the floor to Mr. Ebie to make the arguments for Morocco. Mr. President, I thank you for your two questions and I will start with the very first question because the answer is straightforward. The decolonization of Morocco was not complete when Morocco acceded to independence on the 2nd of March, 1956. For the decolonization of Morocco to be complete, none of the non-self-governing territories belonging to its people should remain under the possession of Spain, which is still an administering power. This is the test that the, court, the International Court of Justice established in the Chagos advisory opinion. According to the court, since the right of self-determination is defined by reference to the entirety of the non-self-governing territory, it followed that the peoples of non-self-governing territories are entitled to exercise their right to self-determination in a relation to their territory as a whole, the integrity of which must be respected by the administering power. Mr. President, under this test, which has been established based on state practice, the administering power must respect the historical territorial scope of the Kingdom of Morocco, especially when, in this case, no other colonial people is claiming Septa and Melilla except for Morocco. Mr. President, I will use just a few examples to show that colonial powers in their totality, including uh, Spain, have recognized the claim of Morocco to return to its historical borders. At the eve of independence, Morocco was occupied by several colonial powers, including France, Spain, Great Britain, Belgium, as far as the international zone of Tangiers is concerned. Mr. President, all of these colonial powers have left Morocco. All of them, none is remaining on this territory except for Spain. Even Spain had started by claim by refusing any return to territory to Morocco of territories on which it was claiming sovereignty. But faced with the strong rebuke of the international community, Spain has changed its position. It has abandoned IFNI. It has given away uh, It has given away Tarfaya in 1958. It has accepted to, to decolonize Western Sahara in 1976. Spain has been scaling down its claims to the territories of Morocco, and this is already a sign. 
the arguments that you are going to hear today from the distinguished Council of Spain have already been voiced in all these three contexts. They never prevailed before the General Assembly nor any other United Nations organ. The General Assembly has never authorized in its practice a colonial power to keep in its possession a colonial enclave. It refused it with respect to Goa. It refused it with respect to Sao Batista de Ajuda. It refused it with respect to IFNI. What is then the difference? Since Spain was claiming the same, was making the same arguments. Mr. President, for the sake of time, I will now like to address three arguments that were raised by Spain and, and also to take advantage and answer your question. In its opening statement, distinguished Council of Spain said that Morocco did not exist in the 15th century. This is a familiar argument. For a colonial power, all African territories are terra nullius. This was the basic premise of colonialism. But the court held, the International Court of Justice held in the Western Sahara opinion that territories which were inhabited by local political entities did not constitute terra nullius. Secondly, Council of Spain claimed that Morocco has confirmed its boundaries through treaties in the 19th century. Mr. President, what the council did not, what council did not tell you is that each treaty was fought back and Spain was forced to return to negotiation. Morocco has never consented to uh, the cession of its territory or to respect any colonial borders. But more importantly, and this brings me to your question, what is the character of the right to self-determination? The right to self-determination is a use cogent norm of international law. And we all know under Article 64 of the Vienna Convention, that treaties in contradiction with use Cogan supervenience are, according to the terms of the Vienna Convention, void and become terminated. Accordingly, Spain cannot rely on those outdated treaties and equal treaties in order to justify its presence in Septa and Melilla. Colonial powers had many treaties to invoke in order to stay on colonial territory. Actually, the colonization of West Africa took place based on several treaties. None of them has kept West Africa in the power of, uh, of France, Great Britain, or any other power. Mr. President, I know that my time is already uh, running. I just want to say that the, no UN organ has recognized the population of Septa and Melilla as people entitled to any right to self-determination or to determine the fate of this territory. What I need to say in order to conclude, Mr. President, is that the Kingdom of Morocco has been through centuries a land of hospitality. It has welcomed people from different religion origins and has protect them, protected them, including by treaties before human rights treaties were uh, common. This is what the Kingdom of Morocco will do. It will abide by Islamic principle and will treat all inhabitants of Ceuta and Melilla in conformity with international law and uh, human rights. Therefore, we extend a warm invitation to the Kingdom of Spain to start the negotiations for the modalities, to discuss the modalities of the transfer of Ceuta and Melilla to the kingdom. I thank you, Mr. President, for your kind attention. Thank you, Mr. Habier, for presentation. I now call upon Mr. Vela to make the arguments for Spain. Thank you, President, and thank you for learned counsel from Morocco for the very elegant, elegant, eloquent presentation. It is a presentation, however, that disguises the fact that tries to cloak what is clearly a non-colonial issue with the mantle of colonialism. And to answer the president's question of whether or not Moroccan decolonization was complete in 1956, 
let me very quickly address three issues that we need to look at in order to come to an answer. Were Ceuta and Melilla ever part of Morocco, either before or during its colonial past? Can Morocco make a claim to incomplete decolonization that lasts to this day? And if the right of self-determination applies, who would hold it? Very clearly, Ceuta and Melilla were never part of Morocco. Hence, there cannot be a claim to completion of the Uti Posidatus identity of Morocco as a former colony needing to regain its former supposed territorial integrity. The two areas were acquired by Portugal and Spain from 1415 onwards. They were previously held by, by Rome, by the Byzantine Empire, and even by the Visigoths, Visigoths. Not any entity of which Morocco could conceivably claim to be a successor and whose pre-colonial integrity has been disrupted by colonialism. From the 17th century on onwards, well, we heard it was a sovereign sultanate uh, which had no Western Sahara type links with the territory and instead concluded uh, numerous treaties in their full sovereignty with Spain. Sultan Mohammed al-Bin Abdullah did it in 1767, 1799, Sultan Mulay Slimani, various others. Um, the fact that we have the expression of the sovereign will of an entity in relation to Spain confirms that this was a decision of that at least notes that these territories were not claimed at the time by Morocco and that there were no links. The decolonization of Morocco was indeed completed in 1956, although of course not entirely because to this day unlawfully, Morocco occupies Western Sahara. But in relation to Spain and the two territories at issue, it was completed with respect to the Northern Protectorate held by Spain it was agreed that independence would take place with respect to the territorial integrity of Morocco. Very true. But that's precisely it. The territorial integrity of Morocco within its Uti Posidatus definition and not including elements of Spain. Madrid was not included. Ceuta and Melilla were not included. The reference to territorial integrity of Morocco can only be understood in relation to the Uti Posidatus boundaries, which absolutely positively did not include the Territory. Territorial integrity cannot be a reference to any additional territories an aggressive Moroccan state might like to possess. Ceuta and Melilla have always been administered separately as part of Spain and were not part of the protectorate or the territory that gained independence as Morocco and its Uti Posidatus boundaries. We should note the emotional case made by Morocco to the United Nations Decolonization Committee in 1960 claiming that the territories for some diffused reason uh, were somehow not decolonized. Well, this was ignored and hence refused by the committee. You said, distinguished counsel, that there was no decision uh, ever in the United Nations on this issue. But Morocco applied to the decolonization commission and its request was not accepted. It's official. The two territories are not non-self-governing territories. The United Nations Committee of 24 refused to list it, in stark contrast to the Western Sahara, which Morocco forcibly occupied, despite the holding of the International Court of Justice to the contrary, and to focus, to home in on the question put by the president. This refusal was well reasoned. In contrast to the Chagos Islands case, this is not a case of excision of a part of an Uti Posidatus territory by colonial power just before decolonization. The territories in question had been part of Spain proper. They were not one of its colonial dependencies. And this was for over half a, half a millennium. Morocco's decolonization in relation to these two territories was fully completed within the Uti Posidatus boundaries of 1956. Decolonization, of course, is a doctrine at the service of the people. It's a people's right. But this is a territorial dispute, a territory, a dispute where Morocco has no real claim based on any kind of legal basis, as was denied, as was confirmed uh, by the UN Decolonization Committee 
there's only the desire of the child to grab whatever lies next to it uh, within its grasp. It's not a self-determination dispute. Spain gave in to the forcible grab of land by Morocco and Ifni, bowing to armed occupation. You say Spain relinquished the territory. You occupied it. And then taking uh, account of the fact that the population was mainly of Arab, Arab origin and favored integration, it did give in to the use of force. The world has resisted the theory of so-called completion of decolonization through what is in essence the conquest of neighboring territory. See the case of Eastern Timor. It is strongly opposed. It has strongly opposed the further land grab in Western Sahara. And this is despite the case that there, the International Court of Justice, in contrast to this case, found that there were pre-existing links between the Sultanate and the Western Sahara. For decades, Morocco has vigorously opposed the articulation of the will of the people of the Western Sahara through the UN demanded referendum. While denying a referendum to the people of the Western Sahara, in this instance, Morocco seems to favor an act of will of the people after all, except it's not the people concerned. Morocco wants to hold a referendum of all the people of Morocco on whether Ceuta and Melilla should be part of Morocco. Well, why not hold a referendum of the people of Morocco on whether Kansas should be part of Morocco? Obviously, as universal practice confirms, it is the colonial entity entitled to self-determination that would need to articulate its wishes, not a large external entity that would wish to impose its dominance on a self-determination entity. And even if, for the sake of argument, the colonial entity was Morocco as a whole in this instance, still a change of possession would need to be confirmed through a plebiscite of the affected local population. Look at the Northern Ireland Agreement. That agreement does actually find that the island of Ireland is the self-determination unit as a whole, but does not permit a change of the status of territory without the specific consent of the majority of people of Northern Ireland expressing their wishes separately. In 2002, Mr. President, Spain was compelled to resist the further Moroccan aggression against the Parsley Island, where there was no population to speak of. The simple aim of Morocco is to add more and more territory just because it's there. And that was revealed in its stark nakedness on that occasion. What's next? The Canary Islands, Sicily, the moon? How can it be a self-determination dispute when the people at issue are Spanish, are fully spot, part? of the Spanish constitutional system and have a strong wish for the state of affairs to remain. They do not wish to have their fate determined by outsiders without regard to their will and wishes. For the mere purpose of territorial aggrandizement and pride outside of the law and the very law, we are all here to maintain and to defend. Morocco has no legal claim to Ceuta and Melina of any kind, Mr. President. Both are part and parcel of the territorial integrity of Spain. We cannot arbitrarily disrupt that integrity and do it against the wishes of the people without destroying at the same time the essential foundations of international law. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Vera. I now give the floor to Ms. Terio to make the arguments for Catalonia. Thank you, Mr. President. I will address, time permitting, three of your questions, those that are relevant to Catalonia. First, does international law give the legitimate representatives of Catalonia the right to effect secession of Catalonia from Spain unilaterally, as they did through their Declaration of Independence of October 10th, 2017? The answer is clearly yes. As I indicated in my preliminary argument, international law contains the right to self-determination for all peoples. As the Canadian Supreme Court has indicated in the Quebec case, non-colonial oppressed peoples may be entitled to exercise their right to external self-determination through remedial secession if their mother state does not respect their right to internal self-determination. The International Court of Justice has silently affirmed that this is correct. The World Court confirmed in the Wall case, as well as most recently in the Chagas Archipelago case, that peoples have a right to self-determination. And in the Kosovo advisory opinion, the world court did not hold that peoples were not allowed to exercise external self-determination. In the case of Catalonia, Spanish authorities have disallowed the people of Catalonia to exercise their internal self-determination. 
In 2017, Spain revoked Catalonia's autonomy, and over the past few years, several Catalonian leaders have been arrested. The exercise of external self-determination can be accomplished unilaterally through remedial secession without the consent of the mother's mother state in extreme instances of oppression. In the Kosovo ICJ case, the World Court held that the Kosovo unilateral declaration of independence was not illegal under international law. At best, international law prohibits secessions accomplished through the use of force, as was the case of the attempted secession of Northern Cyprus. Here, the people of Catalonia have held a peaceful referendum and have not used force in their attempt to exercise external self-determination through remedial secession. Because Spain has oppressed the people of Catalonia and has not allowed them to exercise their right to internal self-determination, the people of Catalonia are entitled to exercise their right to external self-determination through remedial secession. Nothing in international law prohibits this type of peaceful secession by an oppressed people. Second, which are the relevant rules of international law, if any, which outside the colonial context permit the secession of a territory from a sovereign state without the latter's consent? Let me begin by emphasizing the importance of the famous Lotus Proposition, that what is not prohibited by international law is allowed in international law. No rule of international law prohibits a peaceful secession. International law is silent on secession and treats success, successful and peaceful secessions as a fait accompli. The ICJ in the Kosovo case confirmed this approach by refusing to, to declare that the Kosovo secession from Serbia was illegal. As mentioned above, international law contains a prohibition on the use of force in Article 2.4 of the United Nations Charter, as well as in customary law. It follows that secessions accomplished through an illegal use of force may be illegal. But secessions accomplished through peaceful means, such as a popular referendum, are not disallowed by international law. International law also contains a norm protecting the territorial integrity of existing states. That norm, however, applies to states themselves. Secessionist movements are not state actors and not bound by the same territorial integrity norm. The ICJ confirmed this approach as well in the Kosovo advisory case by focusing on the identity of the authors of the Kosovo Declaration of Independence, a non-state actor not bound by the same rules as states themselves. International law also contains the general right of self-determination. This is expressed in the UN Charter, in two of uh, the covenants, which I already mentioned, General Assembly resolutions, as well as ICJ decisions. Although the process of secession is distinct from the right to self-determination, at least one variant of self-determination, the external one, is, is exercised through secession. Thus, it may be argued that international law implicitly condones secession. Finally, evolving customary rules of international law embrace secession. Customary law forms over long periods of time through consistent state practice and opinio juris. States have over the past several decades accepted secession. This is evident from the Kosovo case. By now, over half of the world states have recognized Kosovo as an independent state, as well as from other cases, including Bangladesh, East Timor, and South Sudan. Opinio juris on secession has also been forming. Um, the, as mentioned above, the Canadian Supreme Court in the Quebec case um, implicitly condone that secession may be possible, may be legal in extreme circumstances of oppression. Um, this was also silently upheld by the International uh, Court of Justice in the Kosovo advisory opinion. Moreover, states acceptance of secession as a legal principle is evidence from various states submissions to the International Court of Justice in the Kosovo advisory opinion case. Albania, Denmark, Estonia, Finland, Germany, Ireland, Latvia, the Netherlands, Poland, Slovenia, and Switzerland had all argued to the ICJ that the right to remedial secession was legal under international law in extreme circumstances. Thus, there's an emerging customary norm recognizing secession. Third, has the right to self-determination acquired the status of a peremptory norm of general international law? Here, too, the answer is yes. According to the International Law Commission, a peremptory norm of general international law is a norm accepted and recognized by the international community of states as a whole, as a norm from which no derogation of, is permitted and which can only be modified by a sub subsequent norm of general international law having the same character. Peremptory norms of general international law reflect and protect fundamental values of the international community, 
are hierarchically superior to other rules of international law and are universally applicable. Moreover, the International Law Commission has explained how peremptory norms are identified. To identify a peremptory norm of general international law, it is necessary to establish that the norm in question meets the following criteria, that it is a norm of general international law and that it is ac accepted and recognized by the international community of states as a whole as a norm from which no derogation is, is permitted and which can be modified only by a subsequent norm of general international law having the same character. According to the International Law Commission, customary international law is the most common basis for peremptory norms of general international law and treaty provisions and general principles of law may also serve as basis for peremptory norms of general international law. The right to self-determination is a norm of general international law accepted and recognized by the international community of states. The right to self-determination is firmly embedded in the UN Charter and treaty law, customary law, as well as in, case, in the case law of the International Court of Justice. In the East Timor case, the ICJ held that self-determination was one of the essential principles of contemporary international law. In the Wall case, the ICJ confirmed the erga omnis status of the principle of self-determination. And most recently, Judge Robinson, in his separate op opinion in the Chagos Islands case, clearly established that the right to self-determination was a peremptory norm of international law. Thus, the right to self-determination is such a peremptory, peremptory norm. No states may claim the right to deny peoples living inside their borders the right to self-determination. In conclusion, the representatives of Catalonia have the right to effect remedial secession because the people of Catalonia have the right to self-determination, which they can exercise externally through remedial secession. No rules of international law prohibit this type of secession. Moreover, the right to self-determination is a peremptory norm of international law from which no derogations are permitted. In light of the above, the appropriate remedy for the people of Catalonia is the exercise of their right to external self-determination through secession from Spain. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Terrio. I now call upon Mr. Ocabiala to speak for Spain. Thank you, Your Honor. And thank you to distinguished counsel for Catalonia for her eloquent and stirring argument. However, it remains that Catalonia's claims are ultimately unsupported and in fact antithetical to the relevant principles of international law. First, I'll show that outside the context of decolonization, the right to self-determination does not entail a right to secession. There is no general right to remedial secession in international law um, even if there's no prohibition of it. Second, and in the alternative, I'll show that even if international law recognizes the doctrine of remedial secession, the conditions necessary for its application are not met here. Catalonia argues that international law sanctions its 2017 Declaration of Independence, but the provisions of the UN Charter and the two human rights covenants on which Catalonia relies say nothing of unilateral secession. They guarantee the right to self-determination, it's undeniable that all people enjoy the right to self-determination. However, the principle of self-determination is one of the broadest expressions in the lexicon of international relations. In international law, it's a foundational principle that manifests itself in various ways. As the current president of the ICJ, Judge Yusuf explained in his separate opinion in the Kosovo case, the right to self-determination chiefly operates inside the boundaries of existing states. This conception, commonly referred to as internal self-determination, applies to the entire population of a state, including distinct ethnic groups. However, Catalonia can point to no source of international law that indicates a general right to external self-determination. That is, the right to exercise self-determination by separating from a state. It's certainly not found anywhere in state practice. Rather, state practice is consistent with the General Assembly's 1970 Friendly Relations Declaration, which the ICJ held to reflect custom in Nicaragua versus US. The declaration says that the right, the right to self-determination shall not be construed as authorizing or encouraging any action that would dismember or impair, totally or in part, the territorial integrity or political unity of sovereign and independent states. The absence of any consistent state practice supporting unilateral declarations of independence is consistent with that rule. And there's a good reason that international law, the law does not embrace a general right to secession. It would be antithetical to the principles of political and territorial unity, which underpin the international legal order and are reflected in the principles of territorial integrity and uti posidesis. 
It would introduce perpetual fragmentation and irredentism into the international legal order, which would inevitably pose a grave threat to human security. International law only authorizes external self-determination in the context of decolonization. The era of decolonization in the mid 20th century by which so many new states were formed provides the only reliable source of state practice concerning external self-determination. As the ITJ stated in, in the Chagos advisory opinion, General Assembly Resolution 1514 of 1960 represented a defining moment in the consolidation of state practice on decolonization. And throughout the process of decolonization, the dictates of that resolution were followed with near uniformity. They were endorsed by state practice, including within the United Nations framework. As Judge Sabutinde explained in her separate opinion in the Chagos case, the right to territorial integrity um, of a self-determination unit achieved use Kogan's character, but only in the context of decolonization. The fact that Catalonia is not a colonized territory is so manifest that it requires no explication. And outside of the context of decolonization, international law has nothing to say about secession. It neither bestows on people any such right nor prohibits them from seeking independence. Thus, Catalonia's 2017 Declaration of Independence is an internal domestic affair governed solely by Spanish law. And like the laws of most countries, Spanish law treats secession attempts as treasonous. There may be a few instances in which states have displayed a tolerance of so-called remedial secession, that is the exercise of external self-determination to remedy grave human rights violations, but these instances are too varied and infrequent to demonstrate any consistent state practice, much less opinio juris. And in any case, as I'll now explain, even if a right to remedial secession does exist, the circumstances that could justify it simply are non-existent in the Catalonian case. The theory of remedial secession is fiercely contested in international law. As counsel for Catal Catalonia conveniently omitted, in the Quebec succession case, the Canadian Supreme Court stated that the right to remedial secession is not clearly established in international law. However, accepting an arguendo, it is, by its own terms, inapplicable to the Catalonian situation. It applies only in cases where a people suffer such extreme oppression or persecution that they are deprived of the right to internal self-determination. Moreover, it only applies in cases where there's no alternative remedy available. Neither of these conditions are met here. First, remedial secession requires evidence of severe oppression, um, which I'll now show is not present. The theory of remedial secession is often traced back to the 1921 decision of the, of the League of Nations Commission in the Åland Islands case. In that case, the Swedish speaking minority that inhabit Finland's Åland Island archipelago sought to exercise external self-determination by uniting with Sweden. The commission held that the Åland Islanders were not a people for purposes of self-determination. So in a discussion that was perhaps a bit gratuitous, it also stated that a resort to external self-determination was not justified because the Åland Islanders had neither been persecuted nor oppressed by Finland. In 1992, in the Katanga case, the African Commission similarly held that the Cantangese people had only the right to internal self-determination because they could not demonstrate that Zaire had egregiously violated their human rights. The Canadian Supreme Court in the uh, Quebec secession case uh, reached a similar conclusion. And citing those cases in his separate opinion in the Kosovo case, Judge Yusuf explained that a claim to external self-determination is only legitimate in cases of racial or ethnic discrimination. Since the Statute of Autonomy of 1979, Catalonia has constantly enjoyed an autonomy regime by which it has an exceptional range of powers. It has autonomy with respect to virtually all regional matters. The Catalonian people enjoy all of the rights due to all people by virtue of their humanity. Spain did not revoke Catalonia's autonomy in 2017. It merely suspended it until Catalonia abandoned its secessionist agenda. And Spain resorted to the proportionate use of force in accordance with human rights law and arrested Catalonian leaders seeking secession. So in the end, Catalonia's case rests only on the proposition that the kingdom's refusal to assent to its demands of Spanish disunity is oppressive. But that argument is not only circular, it finds no support in international law. Um, and as reflected in the authorities I've just discussed, um, the Catalonians have ample opportunity to negotiate with the kingdom in good faith to resolve its grievances, so alternative remedies are available. 
As the United Nations stated in its 1992 Agenda for Peace, if every ethnic, religious, or linguistic group claimed statehood, there would be no limit to fragmentation and peace, security, and economic well-being for all people would become ever more difficult to achieve. The court should reject Catalonia's unfounded attempt to introduce such instability into the legal order. The kingdom submits that the court should dismiss the Catalonian claim in its entirety. Thank you. I thank Mr. Cabiala for his statement. At this stage, I was supposed to make some reflections on the presentation on the case, but in view of the time factor, I noticed that we shall not uh, have much time left. And there are several questions that have been uh, uh, presented. And uh, I do not want to take away the robust arguments that have been made by counsel for the various parties. And uh, as such, I would prefer to go straight to the questions which have been uh, asked and uh, uh, give an opportunity to the council to respond. Uh, the first question is addressed to all the uh, the, all, uh, to all the council, all the participants. If we assume that 100% of an autonomous region wants sovereignty other than violence, how can they achieve it if the international community slash courts do not support it? Uh, this is a matter which has been raised. So I would give uh, at least a minute and a half to each of the participants, starting with Dr. Ebi. Mr. President, I will use 30 seconds. They have to go through their domestic law. They have to secure the consensus, the national consensus of their domestic law in order to become sovereign. If their state consent to their sovereignty, no one in the international community can object to it. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Abbey. I call on Professor Vera. Mr. President, I would go slightly further than the previous speaker. Yes, they should attempt to go through the domestic law, but as we know from the Quebec uh, opinion, of the Canadian Supreme Court, uh, if the population, an ethnic population uh, of an autonomous territory expresses itself overwhelmingly and clearly in favor of secession, this is a decision which the central government cannot simply ignore. There's an obligation which is a balanced one on both sides to negotiate in good faith to implement the will of the people through hopefully available democratic and other mechanisms and others. So it is not an either or, it is the beginning of a dialogue and it is precisely the failing of international law which leaves us only apparently the option to fight or to give up. No, there has to be the third option which is the Quebec opinion. You cannot ignore the will of a million or more people but also you cannot unilaterally impose that will on all the rest. You have to negotiate in good faith. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. I call on Professor Stereo for uh, comments. Thank you. Um, I agree with Professor Weller. I agree with everything that, that, that he said. Um, and I would simply add that the difficulty here is um, who calls the shots in terms of deciding when those negotiations are no longer proceeding in good faith? What do we do with the Kosovo precedent? There might be other precedents of the same sort. Um, and you know, because essentially um, colonization is for um, colonization is basically over. So most um, modern day cases of secession or attempted secession um, are occurring in the non-colonial context. Um, I would argue that international law has become 
unhelpful in the sense that it doesn't really provide a normative framework in terms of how we assess those secessionist claims outside of the colonial context. But I would I would reject the argument that it has to be um, the mother state's wish, that it has to be with the consent of the mother state. I think that 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 answer is not satisfactory. Thank you, Professor. I call on Attorney Kabiala for your comments. Thank you. Um, just very briefly, because we're so short on time. Uh, I, uh, I tend to agree with Professor Weller. I think international law reflects the strong preference for territorial stability and in international relations. However, certainly in a democratic society, if 100% of the population of an autonomous region express a will um, for, for uh, 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 independence, then it's incumbent on the democratic leaders of that society to take it into consideration and seek to reach a consensual resolution. Thank you. Now, I think we are further running out of time. Maybe we should try one uh, more question. I mean, we have, I don't know how many minutes we still have. Uh, I, because the screen shows zero. I think we have four minutes. We have four minutes yeah. uh, before we close the session. Yes. Ah, okay. So because I will only need a half a minute for, uh, for my... Maybe the audience would enjoy if you just take the last few minutes to offer any reflections that you have. Indeed. Yeah, uh, because the reflections, uh, the questions were also important, but I, of course, the reflections may not work out in view of what the robust arguments that have been put forward and uh, uh, I just want to touch on the question of the unfinished business of decolonization. Uh, in fact, the international decade for the eradication of colonialism, the third one, is coming to an end uh, this year. And unfortunately, 60 years after the passing of Resolution 1514, we are still faced with the remaining colonial situations which have not uh, been, re been resolved. And uh, uh, the international community through the United Nations has endeavored to solve the problems through the General Assembly, including the late, the recent Chagos case, whereby the General Assembly called for the immediate uh, departure of the uh, administering power. Unfortunately, this has not been accepted. And the tension between the administering power and the, the entity from which the enclave was uh, cut off continues. As to the interplay between self-determination and uh, uh, the question of uh, cessation uh, is a delicate matter for which uh, one has to be careful. The right of self-determination is a right that exists for people who are in colonial situations and in the, my view, in the outside the colonial situation in some special cases where you may need some remedial cessation, which has been referred to, and I have no time to go uh, to, to, to go into it, except that the uh, stability of borders is an important aspect. Uh, there has been reference to it for stages, and uh, even the uh, chamber of the ICJ in the case of Burkina Faso, Mali, said that uh, there was no contradiction between the right of self-determination and uh, the stability. Uh, although some commentators have added that where there is conflict between these two principles, good possibilities should prevail. I don't know. I'm not going to make any conclusion on that one. It's up to the, you to make your own conclusion. I. I, unfortunately, I cannot 
uh, take any more of your time except to say that I am I have to conclude the session by uh, thanking the council for their excellent presentations. I also wish to thank the organizers, including Professor Darin Johnson, Bambington Ashai Joke, Alex Shelton, and West Rest, who have facilitated these uh, deliberations. The court will now withdraw to deliberate on the case. The judgment will be read on a day to be notified to the parties. I request counsel for the parties to remain at the disposal of the court in order to provide further assistance. The sitting, the sitting is now closed. Thank you very much. It's been an honor. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great pleasure.